Hey everybody, uh, hope this finds you well. Uh, welcome to another week of our face-to-face -face lecture that's supposed to, um, that has now been transitioned to online. Thank y'all for sticking with us. Uh, sorry for all the hiccups, but I think uh, I think we're still getting um, still getting it done. But um, be glad to hear any feedback about any of the videos you have. So please send those to me. But today we're going to continue our discussion on the meat science side of things uh, after the animal is fully grown. And we're going to try to look at what, what actually goes into determining uh, the value for a pork carcass. Now, you're going to see a lot of similarities, just like we talked about on the beef side to the pork side, as well as to the lamb side if we, if we get to that point. But uh, overall, those, everything is about the same. Uh, we're, we're all trying to do the same exact thing going through the process. So let's look at some definitions that we're going to probably use today just to help you uh, understand some of the topics that we're going to talk about. So the first key word is evaluate. Uh, when we evaluate carcasses, we, do, we, use, we uh, use it to judge or determine the worth or quality um, of that actual carcass or we appraise it so when we evaluate something we are no no doing no different than we did on the beef carcass side but we're just appraising it when we look at the grade that is a degree or a rating in a scale that classify according to quality rank or or worth so basically we're putting some type of of ranking on a carcass going forward and when we're talking about grading this is actually the the process of to arrange or classify by grades uh, so we assign a grade and then when we grade them grading we actually classify them and put them into uh, arrange them into groups um, and the and the rate according to quality rank worth or we sort them just gives us another opportunity to try to put everything together so we look at carcass grades um, we group carcasses of similar market desirability based on relative palatability and or cutability so just like in the the beef yield grading and beef quality grading we do the same thing on the pork side so that the the process that changed our values and the things that we look for though the criteria is what actually changes So when we grade, um, we sort the carcasses from a heterogeneous population into homogeneous groups. So we take a randomized set of animals, right? We have no bearing on the way they move or the way they enter in the facility. Uh, but we, after we do, we take the heterogeneous and then we put them all into like groups. So heterogeneous, different kind, homogeneous, uh, the same kind or like or nature. Um, essentially, they look alike or they're going to pose the same traits out there. So as we look at this slide right here, this is a good depiction of what we do. So here we are right in the middle. It's a USDA grader. Uh, that's the guy with the magnifying glass trying to figure out what's what. So on our left-hand side, we have the heterogeneous, okay? We see very randomized things. Nothing's, uh, nothing's in order, very much just kind of scattered out there. But the USDA grader actually takes everything, um, puts a grade on it, and through that process, we're able to sort those into homogeneous groups. So now we have all of our circles in one. We have all of our yellow squares in one. We have all of our pink stars, our black triangles. So that's actually what we're doing. And we do that on all species, not just, uh, not just pork or beef. We do that on lab. Poultry is the same way. So we're going to look, talk about a few things today uh, that cover some pork carcass type uh, evaluation, how we actually uh, evaluate that carcass or judge that carcass to actually uh, give us what we want. So here in this picture, uh, we have uh, basically a pork carcass hanging. And uh, as we look at it, we have our shank area up here. We're just looking at some identification terms for what part of the carcass is what. And all those things play a big role in there. So a lot of things we're going to look at right now, uh, these are muscling type things. So we look at their shank right up here. Uh, here's their ham region. 
Here's their loin. It starts about right here where my cursor is and goes down to about here. We call that our loin. Uh, we also have a the shoulder, which we actually break up into the picnic shoulder that has the shank on it right here on the front leg. And then here's the, actually the Boston butt. It's actually the top of the top shoulder. Uh, but in the pork industry, we use it. We call it the Boston butt. Uh, you see this a lot in the pulled pork industry uh, where they uh, they'll smoke a Boston uh, and then pull it um, you see that a lot in that industry but then we have the jowl the jowl down here is a big uh, has a has quite a bit of value uh, a lot of people use jowl uh, actually like in a bean or soup mix uh, to add some flavor so as we're going through, uh, we talked about the muscling characteristics, what we actually some of the I, some of the location of those things. But we look the next thing we look for is actually uh, the trimness or how much fat is actually on the carcass itself, because that's our yield. Our, if we if we have a bunch of fat, our yield definitely drops, and we don't produce near as much red meat lean uh, red meat protein available for the actual consumer. So as we look at that, uh, we have the ham that's starting up here at the top, and we look at this this white line right here, and that's actually what we call the collar, and we call it the ham collar, or the ham or the the fat over the collar, which is right in this region. So if there's a lot of fat right there, very indicative, going to be a more fattier carcass. Uh, another thing we really look at a whole lot is along this whole dorsal edge right here. Okay, now I just referred to it as the dorsal edge so think about a fish okay a fish has a dorsal fin that's on top of their back well if you look at their spine right here this is actually their spine that's where the that white line where my cursor is that is actually where the spinal cord lays so if you look at this um, these are our transverse processes of our actual spine of the animal because the animals cut in half is uh, sawn in half for chilling purposes to produce higher quality product but that is the dorsal edge so those those bones look like a dorsal fin essentially so and when we break that down we start up top we have the last uh, fat opposite the last lumbar vertebrae the last rib where the last rib is on a carcass and the, where the first rib is on a carcass those are very big keys uh, for us to identify or to attack pork carcass we can actually evaluate the jowl for how much fat is in the jowl as well. And we also look along the belly pocket, along the navel edge, or the, the ventral edge as well, we can call that. But the navel edge, because that's where the navel was. So when uh, this pork carcass was still uh, a piglet and still in utero in, the, in his mother or her mother, uh, that's where he received all of his nutrients while he was still in the uterus uh, and so that's why we call it the navel edge so their belly button essentially is right in this region we also look at how much fat is over the sternum itself now if we have the opportunity and we actually and these pork carcasses are ribbed We look at this picture right here, and this basically is just like the ribeye that we evaluated for pork for beef quality. Excuse me. Um, we get to some of the same measurements, some of the same uh, looks on that on, on the actual carcass. So we have fat opposite the tenth rib. So instead of in between the twelfth and thirteenth on a beef carcass, on a pork carcass, we rib them between the tenth and eleventh. So a little bit lower down, a little bit more accurate. Um, picture for us to grab from that carcass so we look at the fat uh, about halfway up the loin eye not three quarters halfway we can see the loin eye size because that's very indicative of how if a carcass is heavy bustled or light bustled how big that loin eye is So as we look at some of the factors that affect pork quality is the amount of external fat uh, and then the degree of muscling that's evident actually in the carcass. Now we can we can actually measure the muscling um, by using a muscle score, but the fat is something we have to actually evaluate uh, to see how much is there. Get measurements if we can, uh, and if they're accurate measurements on top of that, because through the processing, 
uh, of that animal uh, because a human is actually doing it 90% of the time there could be some variation within that within that actual processing uh, series so if they're if they cut to one side or their their saws off at an angle that could affect how that the amount of fat that's there so we have to evaluate every all the factors that go into that so we can give that animal a fair shake at how high a quality it actually is so as we look at muscle scores here's a great picture of what actual muscle scores look like So as we start trying to evaluate or judge these carcasses, um, we see these numbers up here, okay? And these muscle scores are muscle scores that we can um, put into an equation or we just try to note for ourselves how, how heavy muscle it is. So as we look at this three right here, this three carcass, uh, very heavy muscle carcass, okay? Very thick carcass. If we look at... Um, how thick the shoulder is. If we look at the bulge right here, a more bulging shoulder uh, has definitely a lot more than most than the other ones in the picture. Uh, if we look at their ham, okay, we have a lot more plumper cushioned ham up here. Uh, and this is very, uh, very indicative of a very heavy muscle carcass. You don't see all this thickness in just average day uh, type animals. This is a very exceptional carcass uh, as far as a muscling score goes. We can't really evaluate fat. We don't have that proper look. But as we go down the line, we see if we just look at the ham and we try to evaluate across the board, uh, we see three being having the best ham. And as we start dwindling down to the ones, uh, to this one carcass over here, we go to where that, that ham is very... Uh, very small not very plump uh just looks like it's lack muscling so here we have a bodybuilder uh, and over here we have a it's like a more instead of more like a runner type body stature so somebody's very skinny very lean uh, doesn't have a whole lot of muscle mass going into it but as we look at every criteria uh, if you have a trained eye to it this guy has a big a lot bigger loin eye you can kind of tell the turn of the loin right here and if you look at these other ones they're a lot flatter and that's also very indicative of us uh, having a heavy muscle carcass or a light muscle carcass on that turn on that loin and that's what i'm talking about is where we would come across the back of the animal and turn to go down to the side of the actual animal and so that's one thing we try to evaluate as well Now, one thing we try to look at uh, when we look at some of the factors that actually affect pork quality is one, the first big one is lean color. We really want a reddish pink color uh, that's ideal. Uh, and that's a very big word that probably could, that definitely could show up on an exam later. Um, but if we have a pale colored or almost white colored lean, that is bad. And we'll talk about why that bad, it comes up. And then we have uh, the firmness of the lean. The firmer, the better. If it looks real mushy and looks like that it's not holding any texture, um, that's when we don't like it, okay? Soft meat is, is soft pork is bad. Um, and we'll talk about why that comes forward. And then the amount of marbling present in the loin eye, if we have that view, okay? Most of the time within the industry, we don't get that view. We get just the dorsal and ventral edge and we look at marbling scores, um, or we look at uh, muscling scores, excuse me, and how much fat's on them. But um, we won't really get to look at the lean color until we start processing that product. But in the pork industry, they're either good or they're not on pork quality uh, because of the way the industry works and, and we, we know what's acceptable and what's not. Now the last thing goes to the to the lean color and the firmness of that lean uh, is PSE. Okay, you can go ahead and write that one down, highlight it if you if you have the notes there in front of you. But pale, soft, and exudative. That's what PSE stands for. Um, but that lean is considered unacceptable, and we will look at some pictures on why that is unacceptable and talk about how that can affect the supply chain going down the going down the line. So if we look at this chart right here, uh, this gives us a good representation of several different things. Uh, one, uh, if we look at this picture right here, uh, this PSE ham, uh, so it's pale, very, and it could even be lighter than that in the real world. Soft, if we notice, if we compare the muscle structure here, 
uh, into this DFD uh, ham where it looks very firm and doesn't look like it's falling out or falling onto the table or floor wherever it's sitting uh, where this guy one is. And if we, it's actually very extudated. So if we would notice the table that what this ham is sitting on, it probably would have a lot of water just literally sitting there. And that's the water content that's actually coming out of the muscle structure uh, in this PSE, PSE ham. Um, uh, and, and we, this is very unacceptable for water holding capacity. So most pork products in the industry are pump and, pumped or injected. So we, for us to cure them, for this to have a product that has a longer shelf life, uh, we use water, phosphates, nitrates, things like that to help preserve that product and most of the time in the industry to actually go forward uh, and to help us have a better shelf life, which means we can get more product to the consumer at a more economical rate. Now, if we look at our color standards right here, okay, one is pale. Okay, this is bad. We don't, we don't, if it's a one on the color scale, uh, typically in the industry, it doesn't get used. Uh, and we go all the way to six, so a darkish purplish red. Almost looks like beef uh, as, as a color looks overall. But uh, as we go to one through six, uh, this just give us a standard for us to all talk about. Um, that 3.0 right here is what we're really looking for. But five to twos are acceptable. Uh, going forward. Now if we look down here at the marbling scores, we don't marble grade any pork carcasses in the U.S. Um, for the simple fact, it does, it, it does have bearing on the actual carcass on how well it eats, but our, the way the pork industry works, we can raise pork and we can raise hogs, we can raise those animals to be almost identical to each other. We're, the reason being, we have a larger turnover of those actual animals as far as generation goes. One sow can have almost, if we remember back to our reproduction uh, presentation, one sow can have almost, almost three litters a year, okay? Um, she can have a litter every three months, three weeks, three days, okay? So with that being said, we can have more turnover of genetics, okay? Uh, and those with those sows not, you know they don't they don't stay in production more than about three or four maybe five years until we see a drop in their production um, and then they they go somewhere else but uh, we we turn our generations over so much and we've done a, such a good job on quality control and making those breeding selections correct that we can create the same product almost over and over and over that's why it's not that big a thing now, as we look at these pictures here, this is a lot better representation of what uh, a PSE ham looks like. Uh, that top left picture is PSE. We would notice there'd be a big pool of water underneath there. Um, unacceptable. Uh, we're gonna shrink a lot. Like, so let's say we cook it. Uh, we would cook that ham and it would almost be too dry because it wouldn't hold any water. Uh, it has to do with the, the meat chemistry that's in there. And with all that water gone, it's not moist. And the consumer doesn't want that. So, and there's nothing wrong with it if you cook it. It just, it's not gonna give you the best eating flavor out there. Now, if you start looking at RSE and RFN, uh, these are a lot more ideal, uh, but RSE is still somewhat um, unacceptable because of shrinkage. Uh, we're gonna lose so much in the cooking process on the moisture scale and we're not just we're not going to be able to provide a very high quality product now if we look at rfn this is ideal okay firm reddish pink and non-exudative um, that is what we look for in the industry uh, but if we look at dfd um, it, it it has a plus because it's not it's going to actually hold more water um, and it's gonna it could affect some things but um, Basically, whenever we have pumped that ham, it would hold too much water uh, and almost provide a bunch of purge that that, uh, that water looking substance that's in product that's in beef or pork or lamb if you leave it uh, in the in the refrigerator too long. Nothing wrong with it. It's just water coming out of it later. So let's take a quick look at some carcasses. Okay, here's a lineup of four different carcasses. 
Uh, we'll keep them in order, one, two, three, four, going down the line. Um, I would like you to take a quick look, and I'm going to point out some things I want you to look at on each carcass. I want you to look at right here along the, the dorsal edge, how much fat is there. And I want you to actually look at the ham region, okay? Which ham is maybe the thickest or plumpest, okay? And so I'm going to give you a few seconds for you to just take that in, uh, and then I'll pop back in and we'll uh, take a look and, and talk about them some more. And we'll look at each carcass uh, individually as we go through the process. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and move forward. So let's look at carcass number one, okay? Uh, we have an average back fat of a little less than an inch, so 85 hundredths of back fat, and that's measuring that right here in this region. We have a loin eye muscle, this muscle right here, the longissimus dorsi uh, of 7.6, and we have a muscle score of three. So very heavy mu muscle carcass, um, still quite a bit of fat, uh, but still a very heavily muscled carcass. We look at that ham up there. That's a tremendous superior quality ham. We have bulging of the shoulder. We have some turn of the loin right here. Um, if we were in, I can see a little bit of a bulging sirloin right there. Very indicative of a heavy muscle carcass. Very good carcass, very good specimen. So if we look at carcass number two, uh, if we look, our ham's definitely smaller, not near as much turn to the loin, or we don't have near as much of a bulging shoulder right there. If we look, we have eight tenths of fat, so a little bit leaner than the previous carcass. However, have a lot smaller loin eye area, okay? This area right here compared to the previous one uh, is quite a bit different. And so if we look at the muscle score, we're looking at a two plus. So we're not getting near as much muscle out of this one uh, for as much fat. So we're gonna, we would still yield a whole lot more red meat lean off of the first carcass, carcass number one, than we would carcass number two. All right, looking at carcass number three. Um, here we go, we got nine tenths of fat, almost an inch of back fat right here excessively fat loin eye muscle of 4.5 the smallest one we've seen yet uh, with a muscle score of two so very light muscle carcass somewhat light muscles get down there uh, with excessive amounts of fat and if we just look along this dorsal edge right here on the fat content definitely one of the lowest carcasses we've seen so far to date um, but if we look at the ham that ham's not very bulging not a very good turn to the loin and the uh, the coke bottle look is kind of gone from the sh from this animal because we don't have a near enough bulging shoulder going into it and so let's look at carcass number four uh we look at it we have a back fat of over almost two inches um 1.82 hundredths of uh of back fat that is a ton of back fat fat little toad right here um here we have a loin eye area of a 4.9, not the smallest loin eye we've seen. However, he is absolutely the fattest by no stretch of the imagination. And he has a muscle score of a minus two. So if we wanted to, let's say, evaluate and make a competition out of this, and that's something you can do if you further your college career, uh, you can go and judge meats um, and judge meat animals collegiately go chase a national championship just like a football team would uh, and, and represent whatever school you're at. If you're going to an ag school, they have that opportunity. And if you're ever interested in that, let me know. I'd be glad to visit with you about what that looks like and where to go and who to talk to. And uh, it's another great opportunity that has some scholarships that can go along with it as well. But if we were to go back up and look at all four of these carcasses right here, uh, we definitely know four. Uh, if we wanted to compare them and rank them, four would definitely go last, okay? Um, in my opinion, uh, he's definitely the fattest. Um, three would go third, uh, just because by default, 
one of the smaller loin eyes with the most amount of fat. One's going to win the class or win the win out of these four out of the competition pretty easy because it is heaviest muscled, um, not the trimmest, but the heaviest muscled, and he will present a higher percentage of, of closely trimmed retail cuts to the consumer. So that's why one wins, two and three are in the middle, pretty easy to decipher those. Um, and then four on bottom, really easy uh, to look at them. So that's kind of all I got for you today uh, as far as port, port quality eval. And that's what those, that's exactly how the industry looks. Um, when they, when the, the grader in the industry goes through and does it, that's what he's looking for. Is it acceptable? Is it not? Typically they are. If they are unacceptable, they go somewhere else. They do not enter the human food chain uh, and they go to further processing uh, to, to, so they don't, they don't make a consumer not enjoy their product because at the end of the day when a consumer has a bad bad turnout it may be a long time before the industry can get them back to actually trying that product so you really want to make sure every chance they get they get a high quality product uh, and they have a great eating experience for it so but that's all i got for you today uh thank y'all hope everybody's doing well if you have any feedback on the videos please feel free to shoot me a, a, a an email i'd be glad to hear it um looking for a critique actually just so i can make sure i'm giving y'all a high uh, high quality product out there as well uh, because this is not my forte but i want to do better for y'all and just in case this goes on for a long time but thank y'all very much hope y'all are staying safe and healthy i uh, hope everybody's family's doing well as well so thank y'all very much and take care